We're under orders to preach the kingdom of God. Paul did to all men, and command all men in the name of the sovereign God, not simply invite them, not suggest to them, but to command them with a holy authority to repent, to abhor themselves, to take God's side against themselves of all of their self-righteousness and their love of sin and their deep-rooted rebellion and as beggars, bankrupt men and women, receive the kingdom of God as gospel, as good news. It remains true that the first time any human being hears the gospel as gospel, the first time you hear the announcement, God has invaded this universe. He's been here and he's here now in Christ. He's come to rule, and he's going to bring on everything under his subjection. And the first time who have made to be governed, you hear about one who has the right. He purchased it by pouring out his life blood. He has the right to totalitarian, absolute, despotic rule of the deepest recesses of your soul and heart. And that sounds good to you. That's when for the first time in your life you heard the gospel as gospel. As long as that's not good news to you. Why, of course, you haven't heard it. You've missed it. Men and women are to be commanded to believe this proposition. Jesus Christ is a lovely Lord. Whether you are ever saved or not, let me repeat it. This bargain basement stuff they call gospel preaching. If you do this, I'll do this. I've seen multiplied thousands of XGIs finally get to God in spite of the fact that over yonder in a foxhole they got out on the knees when the bombs were bursting and proposition God, if you do so and so, I'll do so and so. But you don't proposition God, you bow to God. We've not yet learned that faith is utter commitment of myself into his keeping, no matter what the consequence. As long as you keep listening to this stuff that says that God will do so-and-so provided you do so-and-so, you're making bargains with God. You've never been able, by faith, to enter in. The big question is, have I embraced this lovely Lord where he is? He's on the throne in a living day-by-day obedient faith. I want to speak tonight on Christ the Demander. The Demander. When my Lord came and visited this earth, on mission bent, not to try to do something, but to do something. He began, the scriptures say, by making an announcement and promulgating a demand. His announcement was, I'm here. From that time Jesus began to preach, and his message was, Repent! That was his demand. His announcement was, I repent, I'm here. 
That ought to change every human being from the top of his head to the bottom of his feet. God visited this earth. God was manifest in the flesh. God was in Christ, reconciling the world. Great is the mystery of godliness. Oh, this tremendous visitation of heaven to earth affects every human being. For time and eternity, the very announcement, the kingdom of God of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent. I see, so it isn't so. This earth was actually visited by God manifest in the flesh. God was actually in Christ Jesus reconciling the world to himself. Great is the mystery God was manifest in the flesh. The no ifs and ands and buts about it, that's so, or it's not so. He began his ministry by making a solemn announcement. The kingdom of heaven, the rule of God, has come down here to penetrate and attack and destroy and conquer the rule of Satan and sin. His enemies are to be defeated. He will not stop, bless God, until his enemies have made his footstool. One day the victory will be final. One day this world will be brought back under the sovereign rule of Jesus Christ. And when he does it, his work will be done. And in language that I cannot enter into the depth, he'll turn the kingdom back to the Father that the Godhead, the Godhead may be all in all. Today, he rules by suasion, then he'll rule by power. But praise the Lord, the future has been invaded. His rule is now small, it's now secret. But even while we wait for that blessed time when every knee shall bow and every tongue confess, men right now may taste of the power of the age to come, may receive eternal life, may be translated from the rule of darkness to the rule and the sphere of God's Dear Son, may come to know by obedience, Almighty God, may receive the life of the Spirit, glory, hallelujah. I wish that every time I had a chance to address people these days, my old brain would click enough that if I didn't say anything else, I could say again and again and again. Let us forever be done with that perversion of gospel preaching that has made religious America the most godless nation this side of hell, to wit that men have been given the privilege of accepting or rejecting Jesus Christ. They have not. God Almighty never did entrust his Son to people that way. No, men are not given a choice, they're confronted with a demand. Men are not invited to repent, they're commanded to repent. It's not a question, I repeat, of whether you bow to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's simply a question of when. The very heart of our trouble, I think, in America 
is our refusal to face the fact that God's ordained that because his Son poured out his soul unto death on a glory tree, that every knee is going to bow in recognition of him. And that every tongue, old Hitler and everybody else, going to be dragged out of hell and brought to the judgment and going to wear you at. Not for salvation, but for the glory of God. I wish that some of the urgency of the gospel of grace might dawn upon us. The grace of God means nothing less than now, ahead of time, before he unseals his power of his mighty arm and makes it bare, that God Almighty, ahead of time, he could well wait, and everybody has to bow, but ahead of time. He proclaims the glorious message that ahead of time men may enter heaven now, right here on this earth, and experience the joy and the power and the glory and the sweetness of being ruled by him in whose hands down at the right hand of God, still to be seen the print of the nails, blooded Jesus, now enthroned. Hallelujah, what a Savior. He came making a, an announcement and a demand. How does one enter the kingdom of God ahead of time? How does one receive eternal life, which is to know by experiencing his power, the only true God and his Son, Jesus Christ? How may one obtain the righteousness that God requires? How may one find the life of the Spirit? which imparts the life of the future. These questions are important. At that time, Jesus began to preach, and he said, Repent, for I'm here. There are perhaps three verses of Scripture. They all mean the same thing. <clears throat> That would be sufficient tonight to answer our question, how may one enter heaven right now? For where Jesus is and where his rule is sweet, that's heaven. That's heaven. Surely it is. That principle of the Bible that what is begun in this life continues in the life to come, and that's so true. How can one enter heaven ahead of time? Be a charter member, bless God, in the rule of God. Let us be definite that the commitment of oneself to Jesus Christ, and a word that I scarcely use now because it's fallen in such bad company, but it's a good Bible word, in accepting Him as Lord and Savior, the commitment of oneself in acceptance of Him as my only Savior and my lovely Lord, surely is the place to start. I insist afresh that if it means that the preacher will go to hell himself and you too, faith is total commitment of myself with no reservation. 
to him as my master. But the initial decision, if I can use that much abused word, must be reaffirmed and implemented in the life which follows. And that's the reason this generation of church members are going to split hell wide open. As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ the Lord, says Paul, tell him goodbye and say, I'm saved, I'm going to get to heaven when I die. No, no. So walk ye in him. We must day by day continue to choose between the Lordship of Christ and the Lordship of sin. One or the other is going to rule your life daily. It never becomes true that we can somehow serve both God and mammon. It is still true. Know ye not that friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is spirit is the enemy of God. Let down the standards. All this in heaven too. And that's present day so-called Christianity. But we dare not lie to men. Not face them with the truth that men and women cannot negotiate a special arrangement whereby we serve two masters. God's a jealous God. And Christ demands true, total allegiance. Sarcastically almost he will say, Why call ye me Lord, Lord? What good is your orthodox doctrine? And do not the things which I say. He just won't pray that way. You can't carry water on both shoulders. You get along well enough by doing a little bit for God while hobnobbing with the devil. You can't be a part of his people while giving allegiance either to the world or the flesh or the devil. This is Total war. Total war. And ladies and gentlemen, everybody that get, don't get in this total is going to miss it. Going to miss it. There is no, nothing gray. It's black or white. It's all out for Christ or it's hell. No wonder we keep trying to recover the great doctrines of the Word of God, the foundation, this gospel that have been lost because men press down the truth that they might live ungodly, unrighteous lives. It's been the plot of the devil. No wonder your pastor runs around like a chicken with his head cut off, nursing some of you folks who are having trouble bowing to God's word. For the bottom of this saying is simply this. Leave out total commitment of oneself to the Lord Jesus Christ and your plans and your plan, your schemes and your perverted gospel can get men and women to go through the motions. But only a miracle of God's grace will ever enable any human being survivors perish, sink or swim, turn oneself over utterly to the sweet rule of the blooded Jesus. It just isn't done by the power and strength or will of men. God has to do it. No wonder we try to strip you and 
Rob you of your assurance, and rob you of your faith, and rob you of your righteousness, and rob you of your profession, and rob you of your decision, and rob you of everything we can think of loose at one end. For only those who are thus robbed will ever do the simple thing. Look, for there's life in a look. Three scriptures. In Romans chapter 10, but what saith it, the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and thy heart. What word? The word of faith. What is salvation by grace through faith? Why do we preach? This is the word of faith, Paul said, which we preach that. If thou shalt confess, now mark it, confessions always to God, never to men. Testimonies to men. It may be true. It may not be true. I say, I love Jesus. That may be so. It may not be so. But confession is never to men. It's to God. And if we confess, we stand up on our hind legs in a godless, lowless age, even in Sunday morning, Sunday school classes. Just a little of the word is enough to uncover the snakes and the hostility in the hearts of this generation of Sunday morning church go. Stand up and tell the cross. That's what it means. If thou shalt confess, if you really want to make a good confession, you will not be able to, apart from the Spirit of God. Thou shalt confess, Jesus is Lord, and shalt believe in thine heart the thing that proves him to be Lord, that God hath raised him from the dead. Mercy upon mercy, grace upon grace, although he don't have to do it, in wondrous grace and promise and mercy, he says, Thou shalt be saved. In the same chapter, he'll say, He who shall believe on him shall not be ashamed. That's not a different way. And in another place, the 13th verse of that chapter, Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord, that's not a different way. And God in this being able to make a good confession is heart that comes by revelation that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And therefore, when the scripture tells about what God did upon the resurrection, he passed on, exalted on the throne, and gave him the job of being Lord over all mankind. Whether they believe it or whether they bow to it or not, no man makes Jesus Lord. God made him Lord. And to be saved means to agree with God gladly ahead of time before he makes you. Involved in that is a calling and a believing. These things are written unto you that you might believe the impossible. Now get these things John concludes his glorious gospel. I could have written the whole Thing, but these things are separated and elected and separate and, and picked out to pinpoint one thing that you might believe something that no human being apart from the work of God's regenerating spirit can possibly believe. These things are right. You boys and girls, you've made a half a dozen professions. You go and sleep on me now. Listen to me. These things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. Nobody but a fool or somebody that's been operated on by the Holy Spirit could possibly believe that that fellow Jesus, who was born in an insignificant little town called Bethlehem, nobody that was anybody that had anything to do with him, 
Every committee that went out to examine him from the religious world found him wanting and turned from him. He wound up being crucified between two malefactors as a common criminal on a gold retreat. He was put in a grave, and as far as this world knows, his body is still resting over yonder in that grave. And you mean tell me you believe Jesus is the Christ? You ain't got sense enough coming out of the rain, are You've been born from above. There it is, folks. That little old right that Jesus is my Savior business, that wouldn't save a flea. Brother, it takes a miracle. Why, anybody got any sense knows that that fellow Jesus isn't the Christ of God, except somebody that's tarried as a seeker until a sovereign God has opened your blind eyes and by a flash of revelation you found out who Jesus is. Somebody says, well, Brother Barn, if that soul fellow can't get saved apart from a miracle, that's what I've been trying to get you to face. That's what this religious world fights till it blew in the face. But that's the God's truth. Oh, soak your soul in this word and cry to God to make Jesus Christ leap out from its pages and be confronted with him in his reality. And there you can say with a certainty I've met him. And he loved me and he conquered me. And I'm his forevermore. Now thank God. This is not simply a verbal confession. It's not to take his name on our lips. It's not to have a creed and be orthodox and say, I believe his Lord. No, sir. This repentance, this confession, this calling, this believing is total. It's utter surrender. And the thing that makes your hair stand up on your head is that every time in the New Testament, I think this is right, that the word, the command, the repent is given us in the imperative mood right now. The best way on earth for you to get under conviction is to try to repent. I doubled all day to get the job done. You just can't do it. If God Almighty has quit barking at your door, and you might get to the place that you become a car, so thou your demand for me, I perish. And I know you can do for me. What I can't do for myself. The one who shall judge you tomorrow confronts you tonight with his command. Will you have his rule in your life? Five times in the New Testament the two words Lord and Savior occur in the same verse, only five times in the same verse, in all five times. It's always the reverse of our vocabulary. It's Lord and Savior. No human being is ever able to claim him as Savior apart from a willingness for his rule to be in your life. His sovereign demands will be settled or you're going to go to hell. Now, bless God, it's not demanded 
that I produce my own righteousness. It's demanded that I repent of mine and receive his. It's not demanded that I give myself life. It's demanded that out of death I cry and he gives me life. It's received the blessed rule of Christ ahead of time. That's grace. It's turning out and receiving. This is grace. You receive life and blessing forevermore. Ladies and gentlemen, this demanding Christ, this demanding Christ, I get so sick and tired of all this foolishness going on today. Bless God, there's a revival worldwide of getting back to the gospel. It's still small, but it's getting bigger. And those who hate this gospel, I know a little bit about what I'm talking about. That tongues are bitter. Phone calls are made and letters are written everywhere I ever go to hold a meeting. I never get anywhere that somebody doesn't want. Oh, but they can't stop it, not just me, but it's everywhere. I get so sick and tired of all this foolishness about fatalism and loss of passion and all of that. Brother, have you ever face the fact that men and women are going to be plunged into hell unless they're able to make total their commitment? If you've got a heart that's as tender as steel, you have a passion to put your arms around men and women, unable to do what they must do. Shut them up if you can, to where they'll look for somebody else to do for them. Whatever their lies they've been taught, they did for themselves. But if you put your hand on it, you will run it. Salvation is of the Lord. My Lord said, I'm here, repent. How radical, how resolute, how costly, how eternal this demand. This demand from bloodstained Jesus is no less than a demand for a resolute Surrender, not with one hand behind your back, see how it comes out, but sink or swim. No bargain business, here I am, Lord. Whatever you do, that's your business, but I turn myself over to you. I still believe that you'll never get saved until you forget all of this business by what you're going to get out of it and turn yourself over to the Lord. he got a perfect right to damn you. Why are you pleading for mercy? That's what they say we preach. Well, there ain't too much wrong with that. He's got a right to send you to hell. If you were screaming, of course, you're not doing it. And he doesn't do it, but he's got a perfect right. He'd be just if he sent the whole outfit tonight to hell, even though we turned us into a giant prayer meeting and begged and pled for mercy. He's under no obligation whatsoever. But he demands a resolute surrender. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, he is orthodox, I will follow thee. Oh, boy, I will. Just look at me. Woo! I will. That little old Willie is worth about 15 cents on the market. I will follow thee. Will the soul of the voice? And Jesus said, is that so? Foxes have holes. And birds of the air have nests, but I don't have any place to lay my head tonight. You come back, great big you, you'll go with me with this ever. It's sort of discouraging, wasn't it? And he said to another, follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. The old man died. Jesus said unto him, let the Kiwanis Club bury the dead. No, let the dead. Let the physical dead, the spiritual dead, bury the physical dead. Let the society for prevention of cruelty to animals and all the do-good societies to the day. Let them take care of that business. 
And you God is the kingdom, the rule of God. And another also said, Lord, I saw thee. I've seen a few of them. Oh, Lord, but let me first go bid them farewell which are at home at my house. And Jesus said, well, we need you. We suffering for Sunday school teachers and we need some more deacons. No, he didn't say that. He said, no man having put his hand to the plow, this is awful. Ain't no room to turn back. is fit for the kingdom of God. He demands a resolute surrender. He demands a radical surrender. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence and the violent take it by force. Or Luke says, the Lord of the prophets were until John since that time the kingdom of God is preached, and every man presses into it. What kind of language is that? I use you to take Jesus, just believe there one. Oh no. Roll up your sleeves. Spit on your hands. Get in, boy. Only the violent do. I'll put what my Lord set up against all of this stuff they call gospel preaching. Now this is it. This is radical. Start to enter it. Agonize to enter in the straight gate, for none shall seek to enter in and shall not be able. This is a radical thing. And if I offend thee, that's radical language. It's better to go to heaven with one eye than to go to hell with two. Think not that I'm come to send peace on earth. I'm come not to send peace, but to bring a sword. My Lord demands a radical surrender. My Lord demands a costly surrender. You know how much it costs the rich young ruler get saved? Everything he has. No wonder he went away. You know how it's going to cost you? Everything you got. I get sick and tired. These people think they're doing God a favor if they give a tithe. I so. You got any money, you're just going to have to go to hell. You own that home of yours, you'll just have to go to hell. No, sir. You're just a steward. Lord, just letting you occupy that home and use that money. That's what the scriptures teach. How much the cause make this total commitment? And then you got how much did it cost? May cost you life. He that findeth his life shall lose it, and he that loses his life for my sake. Better folks than you have paid for their faith with their lives. A Christian is a martyr. He's a potential martyr. A few more years we may learn how to spell that word. Oh, a costless surrender. I'm aware of the fact that I'm going against the grain of popular preaching tonight. We've been told that there's a difference between being saved and being committed, but there isn't. We've been told that Bill's a Christian, of course he's not serving the Lord, but he's a Christian, but he ain't, he's not. He's not. No, my Lord was honest with folks. 
Brother, this is total war. He came to bring a sword. You may yet find out how much it costs to be a child of God. America may yet contribute to the seat of the church by the blood of men and women. Nothing but the grace and spirit of God keeps this mad house, Houston, from mangling God's people now. And God help us, my Lord demands an eternal surrender. And brother, the consequences of it are eternal. Also I say unto you, whosoever shall confess me before men, tell the truth, shall him shall the Son of Man also confess before the angels of God. For he that denieth me before men, Get what he says, but he denies the Lord's rule in his life, and he does it publicly. Shall be denied before the angels of God. Whosoever therefore shall be ashamed of me and of my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of him also, shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he cometh in the glory of the Father with the holy angels. Man's future destiny is right there. Whether or not he's unable to make it, God will make it for him. But he enables some to do it. Whether he's able Turn himself over now, his time, when it's not popular to do it, when it's going against the grain, when it means goodbye to family lots of times. Man's destiny's wrapped up and repent now, surrender now, radically, costly, resolutely, no man looking back. One day, my Lord, will appear as the Son of Man in glory to bring final, full salvation to the sons of the kingdom. We'll be plumb saved then. And at the same time, to bring a just condemnation to the sons of darkness. Meanwhile, sinner, throw down your arms now. Come under his rule. Bow now. But Lord, nobody much doing it. Bow now. Through much tribulation, we shall enter the kingdom. Come on. You say it'll kill me? Yes. Yes. It's utter abandonment, utter commitment. It's nothing more, but God help you, it's nothing less. I think I've told it before, but I repeat it. A rebellion broke out in a sovereign's kingdom. He sent out his arm and crushed the rebellion. Restored his sovereign rule, but many of the rebels escaped, some to the mountain fastnesses and some to the swamp lands. And the king put a giant candle up in the window of his castle and lit it and sent messengers throughout his kingdom, crying with a loud voice, Throw down your arms and come and bow to the rule of the sovereign, and you'll be received and pardoned at grace. As long as the candle burns, the candle of God's long-suffering, 
That's on reading the burn. See, he can get just as many converts if he wraps this thing up tonight, forces all men to bow to him. But it's his grace. It's his long suffering. It's his patience. No man knows how long that candle will burn. It's still burning now. And the gospel comes and says, The great monarch of the universe whose kingdom has been assaulted and threatened. But bless God, when Jesus Christ fell on the cross and was raised from the dead, the world was won, brother. There's no doubt about the issue. And now you're fighting a losing cause. You can't win, my friend. Throw down your arms. Throw them down. Throw them down. And bow at the Master's feet. As God is my judge, that's salvation by the unutterable, glorious grace of God Almighty. My message is done, our Father. Press the radical, resolute, costly, eternal demand of your Son on men and women right now. And we'll just be happy, Lord, if one more time somebody here is faced with this demand. They may walk through it and go on to that time when by force they'll be made to bow. But Lord, be merciful tonight and face them once more in the power of the Holy Spirit and hold back the powers of hell and enable eternity bound men and women to throw down their weapons of rebellion and bow to the Lord. He's the one that was made sin for us. A young woman came to the moment of crisis and she went out alone. So many have been doing that these days. Fighting this battle out, that's good news. It is a battle. She went out and sat on a bank of a little flowing creek. She picked up a pebble <coughs> threw it in the creek. So said, there goes my pride. That's why she picked up another pebble and threw it in the creek. She said, there goes my prejudices. And on and on. And finally, with some hesitation, she knew this was it. She picked up a great big pebble and threw it in the creek. Says, there goes myself. That's it. There goes myself. I died of self that he may be enthroned as Lord of my life. I beg you, as the Holy Spirit may have spoken to you, press these demands upon you. If he's speaking to you, that's God's enabling grace. And you can do what he demands you to do as he deals with you right there. And we are standing, and the invitation is total surrender to Jesus Christ. If you can do it, come and tell us about it. If you can't, come and prostrate yourself and cry for mercy that you can. Cry in your heart, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Hear my humble cry, while on others thou art calling, do not pass me by. Whatever he's saying to you tonight, do whatever he's telling you to do.